Has anybody else got something they want to testify about or anything like that this morning? Feel free. All right. You know what I, I was thinking about? Uh, I was listening to worship on the way here this morning. And it was just talking about we'll remember. We'll remember what you did for us, Lord. We'll remember the, the scars in your hands. We'll remember the price that you paid on the cross. And I think too often we forget. And we get in our own ways and we get doing our own things and we forget that God has done something great for us. And sometimes we just need to say, Lord, I messed up. I'm ready to move on. Okay, I'm ready to get free from the things that I've been holding on to and ready to do the things that I know are right. So uh, I hope that's for somebody this morning. But for those of you who've been following along, we're, we're getting toward the end here of this. Words from the wine press. And today we're talking about a character revealed. See what true character is built and revealed through circumstance. I've never seen somebody that was tough as nails who had been through nothing. It seems like the ones who are tough as nails have been through things that made them tough. We talked about calluses uh, either last week or the week before. It is, it is the dying of skin, but it comes back tougher. Sometimes things in life cause us to be tough. When things heat up in our lives, we often are forced to grow and adapt. Many of you have been there. Maybe you took care of a loved one when they were sick, or you unfortunately have had to bury a loved one at times, that, that, and it just really caught you off guard. You thought it would kill you, but it did not kill you. You're still here, and you still got a story. And you thought, I'll never be able to do this, and then you were able to do it. And it makes you realize that God used that circumstance. Although may, he, he, he may not have created that circumstance, He used that circumstance to create something in you. And Gideon, at the beginning, he thinks he's the smallest of the small, but God used a battle to build his character. And I guarantee you this, in your life, as long as you keep living, God's going to keep using the battles of your life to build your character. And there are the things that are so painful at night, sometimes we lie awake and wonder if we'll even see the morning. But it's building something in you. And see, we're at this point in the story now as we're rounding out. We started out in the wine press, and then last week we talked about as he was getting ready for the war. But now, this is a different Gideon because Gideon is confident now. Gideon is actually about to lead his army of 300 men into a battle against 135,000 men that are camped out of Midian. 135,000 versus 300. You have to be wondering what's going on here, Lord. What are we about to do? And, and while Gideon has been preparing, uh, while God has been preparing Gideon through the wine press, he was whispering Gideon's name into the ears of his enemies. And Gideon was just led into the Midianite camp. We talked about this last week. And he overhears two men talking and they mention a dream that one of them has of bread rolling down a hill and knocking a tent flat. And the other soldier says, this can only mean that Gideon is coming and that he is going to have success over us and he is going to win this battle. See, the story is wild enough, but to think that God led Gideon to two men, two men, out of 135,000, and he said, listen to what they're saying. And they're talking about Gideon, and when Gideon heard his name coming for their lip, from their lips, it lights a fire in him. Can you imagine there's 135,000 men, and you just happen to walk up on two that are talking about you? Wait, you're the smallest of the small. How do they even know your name? Gideon didn't go out before them and win all these battles. It wasn't like he was some great commander. So they all said, oh, there's a great commander coming. We need to be afraid. Gideon is in a wine press. He's the smallest of his clan. He's the smallest family of that. He's the smallest one in his family. He's threshing wheat, hitting out in the wine press. How do they even know his name? And out of 135,000 men, what are the odds that two men are even talking about him? And let me tell you what it did to Gideon. It lit him on fire. It did. He becomes even more confident that God is with him and that when he wasn't looking, that God was moving undetected. And I think that's what a lot of us need to realize. We're over here going, God, where are you at? Why are you so quiet? Maybe he's in stealth mode. Maybe, maybe he's moving undetected. Maybe he's sneaking up on your enemies while he's quiet in your ear. Get what I'm saying? God's working when we don't think. See, that's the kind of faith that we need to have, that God is moving undetected right now. But in time, He's going to lead us to victory in Him and for Him. And Gideon has had to be what? He's had to be obedient 
But what's funny is he's obedient that God's went ahead of him the whole way. And Gideon goes back to his camp and he begins to wake up his men. This We left off right before this last week. He He's went down. He's heard this news that a, that a, roll, that a loaf of bread is going to roll down the hill and take out the stand. He hears that it's going to be, he's going to take them out. He gets fired up and he goes back and he starts waking up his men. And we're going to show that here in chapter 7 in a minute. And it says, see, there comes a time when you have to move from the wine press. Oh, it's so difficult to the war. I stayed here long enough, Lord. It's time to move on. Okay, well, if you're going to get to freedom, you're going to have to go through the battle. I've been over here and I've lived like this and I've taken this for a while and I've endured this and maybe it's built some character for me, but I'm ready to move on. Well, if you're going to get to freedom, you're going to have to go through the fight. See, when we pass our season of oppression to our season of battle and then it moves to our season of freedom. All right, Judges chapter 7, verses 15. Somewhere on there. Oh, I wanted to show you this first. This is this is a, a drawing. I see all this little thing you see is like is the armies of Midian. And look, there's just thousands. And you can imagine you've got your 300 men and this is what you're fixing to face. And it said they were like grasshoppers because they're just everywhere. They're just all over. And they're taking over. And, and imagine seeing this many men and you're about to take 300 to them, but you're totally confident that God's about to do something. See, there's been a change in Gideon's character in the beginning, he's greeted mighty warrior, and he's like, I'm not that guy. But now he's about to take 300 men to this. See, true character is revealed in circumstances. That's why you have some people that when the circumstances get hot, they freak out and they run out. And you got some people who fight. And Gideon's about to show what kind of man he is. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and he worshiped and he returned to the camp. And Israel of Israel, and he called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. And dividing the 300 men into three companies. So now there's, there's three groups of 100. There's three groups of 100. It's the difference in slinging a sledgehammer and slinging a hammer. There's a difference. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Wait a second. We need nuclear weapons. <laughs> You're going to give us a torch and a jar, but nobody questions him. Let's do it. He says, watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. And when I get to the edge of the camp, do it exactly as I do. And when when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then all around the camp blow yours and shout for the Lord and for Gideon. And Gideon and the hundred men with him reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch just after they had changed the guard. And they blew their trumpets and they broke the jars that were in their hands. See, when they broke the jars, all of a sudden they look around and there's flames everywhere. There's 300 torches burning in the night. If you don't know what's out there, that'd be a pretty scary sight. And all of a sudden, a loud trumpet blows. Let me just tell you, loud noise will scare you to death. I will tell you this, how I know this. We went on a cruise with April's parents one time. Yeah. You're with me here. And it's getting to the end of the day. And we've just had dinner and we walk up to the highest point of the ship or whatever there and we're looking out. And I think we were in Mexico somewhere and it's so pretty, you know, and I'm out there and I'm just enjoying it. Well, what they do at the end of the day is they lay down on that big horn and they pull the ship on out to sea. When they let down on that the horn, it goes, Whoa! I went like this. <laughs> I literally did that. It scared me. So bad. So I can understand why everybody blow your trumpet is going to work here. It's going to cause everybody to run in chaos. Because at that moment, I didn't know what was happening. I didn't know if the Lord was coming back. I didn't know if I was alive, if I was dying. I just knew that something... Evidently, it didn't scare nobody else. But I'm over there just barely hanging on. I literally went limp. Verse 20, the three companies blew the trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hand and holding in their right hands the trumpets they were to blow. And they shouted, what? A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. And it's funny because they didn't even have a sword. They had a torch. And they had a horn. (laughs) 
And while each man held his position around the camp, all the Midians ran, crying out as they fled. It freaked them out. And when the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. And the army fled to Beth Shittah toward Zerah as far as the border of Abel, Mahola near Tabith. One more verse here. And the Israelites from Naphtali, Asher, and all of Manasseh were called out and they pursued the Midianites. The noise called such a stir that they turned around and started killing each other. How does 300 men kill 135,000? They freak them out totally so that they start killing one another. And when things are all of a sudden started divided and they start fighting their own kingdom, what a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And what I love about it, this is not the same man we see at the beginning of this story. It's a very different Gideon at this point. Now, now some would, would claim in the beginning that he was scared. And that's why he was in the wine press. He was threshing wheat because he was afraid. But I don't really buy into that because I think if, if I think of him threshing wheat in the presence of his enemies during a time of oppression shows a courage that Gideon had that had not yet been fully awakened in him. It takes a certain kind of man that even though trials are happening, even though storms are coming, even though the, the, your enemy is out there, that you're still providing for your family down in the wine press. Everybody said, oh, he was scared. He was hiding. No, he was, he was providing in the midst of what was a trial. And I believe that's where many of you are. You think, like, you think you're like Gideon, the smallest tribe, the smallest family, the smallest person of the family. But God greeted Gideon from the beginning as a mighty warrior because he could see who he was through his current circumstance. Even though, or he could see who he was through his, though his current circumstance did not show it. So you see that in the beginning. You see, you see Gideon thinks that he's so small and he can't see it in himself, but God sees it through him. And God greeted Gideon by the title that God had gave him before he ever led the army. Isn't that interesting? He says, greetings, mighty warrior. Gideon ain't never fought a battle. Gideon doesn't, he's he never even fought a battle. He's never went to war. How can he be a mighty warrior? It's because God gave him that name before he ever gave him that circumstance. And I think that's the way in your life. I wonder what God's calling you. And you say, oh, I'm not that person. You might be. You might be. You say, I've only always done this. Well, what are you going to do in the future? And he gave Gideon the name before, a name of victory before the victory ever came. And Gideon owned the victory before he possessed its spoils. And some of you have been praying and God's already given you the victory. You just got to go out to the wine press and then you've got to go out to the war. Remember last week when we talked about, we said one plus God is a majority. Gideon had to wonder, how are we going to do this? One plus God is a majority. How are we going to do this? And it says the men went into such a panic that the what? they started killing one another. See, with God, you don't need bigger armies. You just need better tactics. There's a lot of times where we just go, I don't know. I don't know. How are we going to do this? I don't know. Do we think it's the right thing? Exactly. How are we going to do this? How are we going to go forward? We don't need uh, bigger armies. We just need better tactics. What man would think it was possible moments before that God brought it to pass? What, what man in that army was probably sitting there thinking, you know, we're fixing to take 300 to 135,000. We just trust the Lord and we trust Gideon. How's it going to happen? I don't know. But I want you to notice something about Gideon at this point. I want you to see the man who self-proclaimed himself the smallest of the small. All right. Pay attention here to Gideon. Gideon sent messengers through the hill country of Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and seize the waters of the Jordan ahead of them as far as Beth Barah. So all the men of Ephraim were called out and they seized the waters of the Jordan as far as Beth Barah. Gideon is calling the shots in the midst of hot pursuit of a fleeing Midianite army. And if you've ever felt like the underdog, this should excite you. What if God is about to reveal your character through your circumstance? You say, man, I hate this season that we're in. I hate that so much is heating up. But what if God is heating it up so that you might move into position to do what He's got for you next? 
You're over here and you're so comfortable. If you get too comfortable, you'll stay there. And what I found is when people get comfortable, they go to sleep. God is heating up the circumstance so His church might come alive. If everything is perfect, we're not going to come alive. What we're going to do, we're going to sit back and relax. So Gideon did not know he had these abilities within him until his circumstances heated up. And the change of his circumstances birthed something from him that he did not know he contained. So we pray, please Lord, don't let anything happen to me. But what I'm realizing is that we're forged in fire. He's like, like Gideon doesn't know this even exists in him. But then all of a sudden when stuff's heated up, all of a sudden things start pouring out from you that you didn't know you had. I've had to be a greater father than I thought I was because the circumstances called for a greater father. I've had to be a better husband than I thought I was because the circumstances called for a greater husband. So I had to lean on a greater God and say, oh, I, I, I can't do this. Right. Right. You can't. But God through you can. I want, let's look at, uh, at this final verse of, of, of Judges 7. They also captured two of the Midianite leaders, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb and Zeb at the winepress of Zeb. And they pursued the Midianites and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon, who was by the Jordan. I'm kind of wondering when Gideon's sitting there, he's like, what am I going to do with these? <laughs> you know, remember when David killed Goliath and he, he went on and they, they chased the Philistines around and then it said sometime later, David is still in there and he's with Saul and, and he's holding the head of Goliath. I'm like, why are we still carrying his head? <laughs> I don't know, I guess it'd fire me up if I was in the army and all of a sudden you come back with a king's head. And so, so Gideon now has the heads of the two Midianite leaders brought to his feet and the men honor him so much that they lay the heads of his enemies at his feet. Come on. Do you not see that? Do you not see that transformation of character? Here's a guy who's nothing, but now his armies are laying the heads of kings at his feet. And it's because God took a guy in a wine press, He brought him through a war. And he's going to bring him to freedom. They don't hear Gideon refer to himself as the smallest, the smallest, the heads of his enemies are dropped to his feet. There wasn't nobody calling him small that day. They were bowing down and paying homage to him. It transferred him, it transformed him, it, it, it moved him from one place to the next. All of a sudden, you're not the smallest of the small. All of a sudden, you're actually living up to greetings, mighty warrior, which is the name God gave you in the beginning. And I wonder what name God has given you in the beginning. You don't hear doubt in Gideon's voice as he commands the messengers to summon the men from Ephraim to come out and fight. He didn't doubt. Go get the men from Ephraim. Go do this. Go do that. And you know what's interesting to me? Is the men listened to him and they went and did it. This is not the smallest of the small. This is Gideon, the mighty warrior. And one thing I, I notice is that the men trust his leadership because no one has questioned Gideon at this time. So his own men don't see the smallest of small. And God has not only whispered Gideon's name into the ears of his enemies, he's wrote it on the names, or he's wrote it on the hearts of Gideon's men. Isn't it funny? We don't need to do our own promoting. We don't need to go around pounding our chest. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Because when God gets ready to do it, it's funny. He just whispers it into the name, into the ears of the enemies. And then He just writes it on the hearts of His men. And then Gideon's able to accomplish what he needs to accomplish because he didn't have to promote himself. Because why? God did the promoting. I didn't get up here through self-promotion. God decided to promote me here. And the things, the same way with you at your jobs and at the things that you have going in life, you got to where you're going because God decided to promote you to where you are. He wrote it on the hearts of Gideon's men as well as he whispered into the ears of Gideon's enemies. See, they're willing, the men are willing to obey his commands and they're confidently following the orders of Gideon. And you know what? They're succeeding. They're succeeding. There's more to this story. Let's, if you have your Bibles going to Judges chapter 8, but Gideon, what he's doing now, he's, the, the Midianites are on the run. They're running. And Gideon is pursuing the kings of Midian. Zeba and Zalmunna is their name, if you're looking for any great kids' names. <laughs> Rachel, this will be great for you and Jeremy. <laughs> 
They're running from Gideon at this point. That's interesting to me too. You've got an army of 135,000, but yet you're the king and you're running from Gideon. It's because God's whispered your name into your enemy's ears and they're afraid of you. So you didn't have to promote yourself because when God promotes you, it'd be enough. What looked like an impossibility, there is too many, has crumbled in a moment. What seemed like unfair odds is all of a sudden unfair the other way. And Gideon, he goes through the town of Succoth and his men are, are, are uh, they worn, uh, they're worn out from the battle. And he asked, he asked him, he said, can I have food and water for my men because they're tired from chasing the Midianites. We're, we're tracing and trying to get, we're trying to get um, the kings of the Midian and we're chasing them down and we're tired, we're exhausted from the battle. And they said, oh, when you, when you capture them, we'll come back here and we'll feed you. See, the people in, in the city don't realize who Gideon is right now. And I almost wonder if Gideon's like, yeah, okay, just remember my name. And he did. He tells them that. He says, hey, okay, that's fine. Don't feed us, don't give us water. But when I come back, after I capture them, I'm going to take the elders of your town and I'm going to whip them with thorns. And that's pretty bad. So he goes on to the next town and he asks for food and water. And I guess his patience has really, really went thin by then because he tells him, he says, okay, y'all, y'all aren't going to give me food and water because they told him the same thing. They said, We're, yeah, go, go capture them first and then, and then come and ask for something. Some great town you are. <laughs> he said, okay, but when I come back, I'm going to tear down this tower that's in the middle of your town. And so, so he continues down. And Gideon continues on the trail of Zeba and Zamuna and comes to the town of Peniel. And that's when he tells him he's going to tear down the tower. And Gideon says, okay, I'm coming back. See, it's a very different Gideon now. This is a warrior. I guess the town got the memo about the guy in the wine press, but they didn't get the memo about the warrior. See, everybody don't see the change that happens in you. But they're about to. Judges chapter 8, verse 10. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor with a force of about 15,000 men. So now still it's 300 versus 15,000. That's if none of the men of Israel have lost any of their life at this point. And all that were left of the armies of the eastern people and 120,000 swordsmen had fallen. So 120,000 men have already died. Pretty crazy. And Gideon went up uh, by the route of the nomads east of Noba and, and man, Jog, we'll give that one a try, and, <laughs> and attacked the unsuspecting army. And Zeba and Zamunna, the two kings of the Midian, fled, but he pursued them and captured them, routing their entire army. And Gideon, son of Joash, then returned from the battle by the pass of Harris. And he caught a young man, a sucker, and he questioned him, and he said, young man wrote down for him the name of the 77 officials of Succoth, the entire, uh, the elders of the town. Thanks a lot, guy. <laughs> the Gideon, then Gideon came and said to the men of Succoth, here are Zeba and Zalmunna about whom you taunted me by saying, uh, do you already have the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna in your possession? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? Why should we give bread to your exhausted men? And he took the elders of the town and he taught the, he taught the men of Succoth the lesson by punishing them uh, with desert thorns and briars. Have you ever seen desert thorns? They're not small. And he just said, okay, I've got Zeba and Zalmunna. I need these people right here. And you remember in class when you had your name written off, it's not fixing me a good thing? Like, they start calling out names and you're going, oh, that's my friend. That's my friend. Oh, that's me. <laughs> you know, and the elders are like, he's got the kings of media. He's done defeated, let's say 120,000 men are dead. And he's got, he's come back here for a reason. And he does. And he whips them with those briars. And they don't know who they're messing with because Gideon isn't in the wine press in the more because he is kicking butt and taking names. And he goes to Peniel. And look what he says here. He pulled down the tower of Peniel. And this time did what? He killed the men of that town. You don't want to give me food and water? I will capture the kings. I'll bring them back to you. And it's fixing to get ugly. It's a different man now. Now one final thing about this pursuit I want to show you. 
I read this for the first time and it, and it struck me how God could shape the character of man or reveal the character of man in the eyes of others. Verse 18. Then he asked Zeba and Zalmunna, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? Men like you, they answered. Each one uh, with the bearing of a prince. Wait, what? What? I'm the smallest of the small. And now the kings of Media who had an army that was way more, way more people than I could ever have, they say men like you? Oh, you must mean small, insignificant men. No, wait. Each one with the bearing of a prince. Each one. It's almost like, you're, like you want to go, wait, you think I look like my father is a king and I'm a prince? So it's interesting now because Gideon has changed, and it says Gideon has changed the way, or God has changed the way that Gideon looks at himself, and he's changed the way that Gideon looks at uh, looks like to his men, and he's changed the way the elders of the surrounding cities look to him. I'm sure it has, and now he's changed the way his enemies look at him. What do those men look like that you killed? They look like you, Gideon, like the son of a king. Greetings, mighty warrior. Surely you're not talking about me. I'm the smallest of the small. Some of you have that mindset right now. I'm the smallest of the small. And God's over, saying, over here saying, no, you're the son of a king. Isn't that what we are? We're so worried about what's going to happen. But yet we're the sons of kings. We're the sons of the king. Co-heirs with Christ. So Gideon looks at these foreign kings and this is what he says. Gideon replied, those were my brothers, the sons of my own mother. And as surely as the Lord lives, if you, if you had spared their lives, I would not kill you. And turning to Jether, his oldest son, he said, kill them. But Jether did not draw his sword because he was afraid. He was young. And they shouldn't have challenged Gideon at this point. They shouldn't. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't have challenged him and, and questioned his character. Because look here, Zeba and Zalmunna said, come, come do it yourself. As, as is the man, so is his strength. So Gideon stepped down. He stepped forward and he killed them. And he took the ornaments off their neck. How, how dumb do you have to be as the kings of the Midianites to go, just do it yourself. You think you're so bad. Hey man, I just led an army that killed 120,000 of your men <laughs> with an army of like 300. And you're going to call me out Man, you got to think for a man, his pride had to swell up and he was just like, all right. <laughs> you want me to kill you? Here it is. I'm going to do it right here. So, so they say, do it yourself. And Gideon has been kicking butt, like I said, and taking names. And Gideon has just led 300 men against 135,000. And Gideon has just thorn whipped elders and, 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 and tore down towers and killed the men of neighboring cities. And do you honestly think he will even slow down over them? He's going to go right through them like a speed bump. Do you think that these kings mean anything to him? It's like, you know what, don't challenge me. Gideon at this point, he doesn't even think twice. You know, he told Jethro, he said, do it, just kill him. And he went and do it. And But they said, oh, kill us yourself. He said, okay. It's not the same man. He ain't worrying in the wine press anymore. He's not even worrying through the wine press anymore. He's already done that. He's just gaining victory now. The Gideon in the wine press is not the Gideon at the end of the story that's slaying kings and whipping town elders. See, the war from the wine press built Gideon and it formed his character because true warriors of God are built through a process in difficulty. Gideon's tired at one point. He's calling. He says, oh, give us food and water. I'm worn out. But you know what? God is doing something through all of those things. And how dare some kings of media try to stand against and say, question him, be like, just do it yourself. You're so tough. Psh, I'll just kill you. <laughs> I'll just kill you. I was in the wine press hiding from him, but I ain't in the wine press no more. And there comes a point in our life where we say, I'm not who I used to be. No, I am this man now because these things in my life have produced this. I would have laid over and cried here but I'll just kill you now. <laughs> Gideon's character has changed because his circumstances have produced him. The greatness of Gideon 
is it's not that he's done these great things and been able to. It's the greatness of Gideon is who he's placed his trust in all along. The greatness of you and I in the story of our life will be who we've placed our trust in. And, and let me show you what I mean here. The people want Gideon to be their king after this. He kills their kings and no, he, he, he frees them from the Midianites who they've been subject to for seven years now. And this is what he said. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, rule over us, you, your sons, and your grandsons, because you have saved us from the hand of Midian. But Gideon told them, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you. Who? The Lord will rule over you. I didn't do this. I was used to do this. By who? The great king. You don't need a king. You need the Lord. And some of us right here, even, even right now, even in election time that we've been through, we don't need a great president. We need the Lord. And we need the Lord to fall on a president. And you know what? It don't matter which one it is. Because if God falls on, that's what's going to matter. And you know what? If we don't, and I have to sift in the wine press for a little while, you know what? There'll come a war and then there'll come a time of freedom. And you know what? The God who was with me in the wine press will be the God who's with me in the war and the God who will be with me after the war. See, Gideon had, brought, had been brought from the wine press through the war and now into freedom. But he realized that only God could have done it. And Gideon thought he was weak in the wine press. But God actually thought he was worthy of the wine press. You ever get through something and you go, maybe it's just that God thought we were worthy to be in this situation. We talked about it on Wednesday night where where Peter, uh, they, they get brought before the, the government officials there and, they, and they're, they're ready to kill them. And then somebody speaks out to them and says, don't kill them. So they just beat them and let them go. And you're like, well, that's, that's kind of rough too. And then it says they left joyfully because they felt worthy to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. <laughs> they were worth it. So you can't trust your feelings. You have to trust who your God is and let Him define you. Because I've known this, feelings change. I can have a little too much coffee and I can be jittery. <laughs> All right? I can take a pill to feel good. I can take a pill to feel bad. All of it. My feelings change. As hormones shift, feelings change. People get crazy. But one thing that doesn't change is whoever God called you in the beginning. When He called you mighty warrior. See, see God knew you would be in the church in 2021. Some of you didn't even know if you'd make it through 2020. See, you're not part of God's kingdom by mistake. Imagine that, that you were actually created for purpose. And people may have told you all along that you'd never be nothing. But what if God's saying, greetings, mighty warrior? Oh, I'm nothing. Who told you that? Who told you? I've said this a couple times, but can I just proposition you to swap from Facebook to FaceTime? What I mean by that is, can you just get on your face before the Lord and quit looking to your news feed to get your news? <laughs> Instead of getting my feelings changed because I read another story that's another disappointment, why don't I write the narrative? And why don't I just get before the Lord and I just pray and I say, Lord, I don't know how we're going to make it through it, but just carry me through it. And as He carries me through it, maybe I might just get defined into something that would be great. Yes, Pastor, how, how do I do that? Listen, just stretch out before Him. Literally, face down. Stretch out before Him. Quit listening to the noise of your news feed. And I'll leave you with this. Get alone with God. Get God. And let Him define you. That's, that's what I would say to you. Is I would say quit, quit, quit worrying about all these other things and realize that you're a character that's being revealed through circumstance that God has something for you. And just maybe, just maybe that you're worthy of the things that you're going through right now. Not that you're worthless, but that you're worthy. God says, oh, I've got something for you. If you just realize that you'll battle for a little while, I'll bring you to a place of freedom. Man, do not let this moment define you. Let God define you. 
Let's stand together. This morning, the altar is open for people who say, Lord, define me and use me. And Lord, you know what? Like we said, we see not strengthen our hands, Lord, in this time where we don't know what to do. Make us stronger every day to do your will. And if that's you this morning, say, I really don't know where I fit. I really don't know where I am. I don't really know what to do with this season of life. These circumstances that I had, they pushed me to a place that I don't want to be in. Can I just say this? Maybe, just maybe, God is going to use this season of circumstances that we don't like to produce something great greater that might just save a few more people for him because in in a hundred years none of us is going to care none of us is going to care we're not going to care that one day something bad happened to us one day we got up and everything went wrong we're not going to care it's not going to matter so why don't we run while we got time the altar's open today